Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight, I would like to do education, part four, students, which you would think would be the most important part of education, but of course, are the least important part of education as we're learning. Um, two things to start with. One, actually, somebody moved from my June class to my September class. So if you're interested, there's one slot available for the June uh, class in the garden, the Life Philosophical. So you can go to the website and you can see all the information there. Um, two, several people noted in the comments, and I got some emails saying that I was being sort of overly broad and categorical in my last lecture, saying that there's just no evidence that um, students being trained in our current system, you know, six or seven or eight hours of classes, 50 minute hour long classes, broken up through the day, very limited recess, is an, effect, an effective and efficient way to impart knowledge to students. And I, you know, absolutely question this. I encourage questioning and, and research and study. What no one has done is sent me a study that demonstrates through a longitudinal study of groups of cohorts of students over time that this system is any good. I mean, that's, that's it. So if you have such a study, a credible longitudinal study would probably be the best, but there could be other ways of doing this that suggests that really this is the best way to take, you know, six, seven, eight-year-olds and impart knowledge to them um, <clears throat> over a K through 12 period. Please send it to me because I, and, and if it's credible, I will at the beginning of the next lecture uh, reference it and discuss that because I've never seen um, any evidence to suggest that our system is not even, I'm not saying maximally, not, not a perfect, it's an imperfect world. Uh, you may have noticed this at, at, on occasion, but you know, at least, you know, really pretty effective. Like, like the research shows, this is the way you should go about doing it. Never seen any research to suggest anything remotely like that, but I could have missed it. <clears throat> so, um, if you have such a study, please send it to me and I will reference it. But basically, I I will be shocked, happily shocked, because I love to learn. Just, but just, yeah, it's there just isn't any, um, I'm afraid. So, uh, but please, if you do have one, send it on in. Um, so students, students. So again, I mentioned at the beginning of the series, slightly confessional. And part of this is my experience as a student. I was not a, mm, I'm not a bad student. I was a crosswise student. I'm sort of a round peg in a square hole kind of student. And this isn't all on the teachers and administration, so I don't want to make it sound like that, where I did struggle with school in some strange ways. Uh, my childhood was a bit unsettled, uh, shall we say. So for instance, like when I was from basically seventh grade through 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 high school, through soft, senior in high school, I didn't have books or papers or pens or pencils or things like this. And so I'd always borrow them from my friends if there was a test or an assignment that we had to do in class. By the way, thank you to my classmates of, of yore who provided me with those supplies that allowed me to get through school. So for instance, I just basically was never doing homework because I didn't have the books. So that was, so I had these weird things where I might do okay on the test in class, but I you know, miss all the homework or I'm supposed to hand something in and, you know, I don't have any paper. So it, it it was just, it was a struggle. So my experience with school was always this mix of <clears throat> frustration with the system, frustration with outside forces, and then this really strong desire to learn. I really, you know, for whatever reason, just innate, apparently, as far as I can tell, I really love to learn. And I can remember um, I was switched schools at one point and the school we went to was very much further ahead than the school we left. And we, so the class was doing long division. Oh, this is third grade or something like that. And I was sitting in class and, and it, I could not figure out how they knew, right? How did they know how many times 147 went into 12,632? I thought the other students just knew it. Like how they had memorized the multiplication table. They had memorized like the long division table that, and I just didn't have access to it. And so I was at home with my little sheet of, of, of paper to try and work on this. And I was just crying because I'm like, how do they do this? And it's just not being able to figure things out would just frustrate me to that level. And so, you know, I was probably a little over intense for most of the learning environments that I found myself in because, <clears throat> you know, I was just driven. And my brother, my older brother, Chuck, thankfully, explained to me like, no, you just kind of guess. And I'm like, what? You can guess? He says, yeah, you just kind of guess. And See if it's close, and if it's a little low, you go up. If it's a little high, you go down, and then you get the remainder. And I was like, oh, my. I was so happy. I was, like, giddy. I went to class the next day. I, I wanted to answer every question in class because I was just so excited. I was just giddy. Um, so I went from, you know, 
it's like it's so frustrated i'm crying to so giddy i want to answer every question so you know as a caveat my 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 experience as a student was uh, vexing i will say um as i was growing up <clears throat> so with that with those preambles let's get in there and here's the thing to know uh, about how students are treated and one thing to remember is that students, this is a compulsory institution-ish in the United States. You're supposed to have to go to school. We have homeschooling, alternative schools, we have all this other stuff. So we'll talk a little bit about that. But, but mostly it's important to understand that it is compulsory. Even though the children have committed no crimes, they are sentenced to uh, going to this institution and going there every day for many days in the week and then many years of their life they will spend in this institution. So the theory is that the institution for taking such a huge chunk of young people's lives should provide them with something of value. In fact, so valuable that it is a, a, a fair or ethical exchange for the vast amount of time in which they are put under the control of this institution. Um, and I, it's, to me, this is just the core of understanding education. We're taking a part of someone's lives, particularly in the K through 12 system, who has not volunteered for this. And how can you justify that? How can you reciprocally meet the ethical obligation of having a chunk of someone's lives, particularly when they're mortal? Now, if we're immortal, this would not be a problem at all. But it turns out we're mortal. So that core ethical conundrum is always, always there in my, in my mind. But what we've decided to do in education is always blame the student. Anything that's wrong or a problem, generally speaking, if, if we don't talk about money, then we talk about students. Um, and the, the trick here, and if you learn to listen for it, it'll be very helpful. One of the ways of, of sort of seeing how this works is anything that involves the students is active voice. The students did this, the students did that. The fifth grade did this, the third grade did that. Anything involving teachers and administration tends to be passive voice. So uh, the classes were over enrolled, not the administration had insufficient classrooms. See, the administration didn't do it. The classrooms were just over, right? It's sort of all these, you know, elliptical phrases and passive voice constructions. So to, to wit, great example, um, a lot of states will give their first standardized test when student, what first state mandated statewide, they give them all kinds of standardized tests all the time, but the big statewide ones are often in the third grade. <clears throat> Fifth grade also very popular, but let's say this is the third grade. So you have eight-year-olds, right? Eight-year-olds. And so then the scores will come out and they, they will say, you know, uh, third graders failed their state exams. Uh, third graders failed their mathematics exam at this incredible rate, or third graders did poorly on the state mandated exam. Well, that's just madness, right? You're blaming the students, not the responsible adults. The students, right, they didn't design the education system, they didn't design the school, they didn't design the test, they didn't want to take the test, but it, it, they didn't teach the classes that they had in freshman first grade, second grade, and third grade. I mean, and yet somehow the eight-year-olds, they're the ones who are failing. See the, see the magic of that? How, how beautiful. Let's blame the eight-year-olds. Really, we thought about it. We had a meeting and we thought, yeah, it's those eight-year-olds. They're the ones that are really undermining the core of the educational system. Equally well, you could say um, first kindergarten, first and second grade teachers do crap job of teaching math. That would be at least put the blame onto adults, whether it was fair or not, I don't know, but, but at least the blame would rest with, you know, people who aren't eight. Uh, or you could say administration gives pointless crap tests that no one can pass. Then it would be blame the administrations and the test that's being given. Okay, again, at least it, the burden is being placed on adults. Nah, this is not going to happen. So the language is almost invariably uh, that of students cause the problem um uh, gr other great examples and i could go on endlessly but just a few more i'm sure you're familiar with all these headlines and, and if not you know search search for headlines you can pull up the news headlines and you'll find these you know it's just state exam results and they'll say oh students did this students did that students did this you, and, and it's always the students that are, is under 
scrutiny. They're either passing or failing, not the system, not their teachers, not the, not the classes, not the preceding years. <clears throat> or they'll say something like, oh, um, you know, enrollment, large student enrollment causes oversized classes. And th this is one, or, or, or conversely, uh, low student enrollment causes budget cuts, right? So either way, but notice in either direction, it is the student's fault. Either they didn't enroll or too many of them enrolled. Now, most K through 12 students, you should have a pretty good idea from year to year about how many students you're going to have. Maybe you live someplace where there's massive and rapid demographic change, but that's not that common. You've got to know within a few percentage because the first graders go to second grade and the second graders go to third grade and the third grade, right? So it's not like they come from no place. It's not like you empty the school out every year and go, we have no idea what students we have. We're going to start from ground zero. No, you usually go, well, we have X number of students, you know. So one way of saying the classes are too full or the classes are under enrolled is to say the administration has no idea to make accurate projections about the number of students they should expect. Because that's what's happening. It's not the student's fault they didn't enroll or that too many of them enroll. <laughs> they don't have a choice. Right? It's not, they, if, if they're there, they're supposed to, by law, enroll. So to, to blame, I mean, it's just madness, right? And again, I, you can see that, oh, it's, a, it's easy to say, oh, well, these are equivalent ideas. In theory, they are equivalent ideas. In practice, again, it transfers the burden of responsibility onto the kids and you, in every aspect of school. Oh, you know, this, you'll see headlines like uh, diversity of student population creates problems for teachers. It's, uh, yeah, ah, right? Like the students are the students. The teachers probably should have a fair guess at the demographic makeup of their community. Because again, if this changes overnight, fairsy squaresy, right? If you get 10,000 immigrants from someplace that no one expected to show up, then hey, that's fine. This generally is not what's happening, right? If you live in a, an area that's 60% Hispanic, you just can't be shocked that a lot of your students speak Spanish. This is, this is not like a mind-blowing revelation. But again, you know, it's the students' diversity that's the problem. If those students weren't so diverse, we wouldn't have a problem. <clears throat> and again, you can see this at, in, in every level. So what's happening here, the mindset was several mindsets. One, blame the students instead of blaming us, which of course is quite simple. But the other idea is, and I mentioned this uh, several times, is this factory model. Now, if you're trying to build something in a factory and you get crap input, you go, hey, the computers we're building aren't working the way we want because the chipsets that we got from this other person, this other manufacturer, um, are flawed in some way or they don't meet the specs they're supposed to. So, boo, problem. And everybody goes, yeah, hey, that's... Fair enough, right? We're, we're not messing up. We've got to go to our supplier and get them to fix this or get another supplier. <clears throat> so education has adopted this model. And what they've done is they've come up with the imaginary perfect student. So the imaginary perfect student shows up on time every day, ready to learn, committed to doing whatever the teacher says in a timely and focused manner without making noise, finishing all their work when it's mandated to be turned in, with no complaints and no confusion. Uh, they don't mess up anything. They don't wreck anything. They don't break things. They don't cry. Uh, they don't get angry. They don't get frustrated. And then they will take the tests that they're given and they will do well on those tests. And that way, everything will run smoothly and we will have no problems. And that's how we would know education is working. So any variation from that, the problem must be the students, because we know the system is great. We know the system is essentially perfect. Can't be changed, can't be improved. So, well, that's, well, what else could it be? It must be those little bastard students. They keep messing things up. They come to school unprepared. And again, what do you mean they come unprepared? They come, if, they're, if they're nine, they're a nine-year-old. They come as they are. To say that they're unprepared means you don't know who your students are and you have no idea how to deal with them. This is, it's, it's, like some, it's like a doctor at a hospital going, guys, people keep coming in here sick. How am I supposed to deal with this? Of course they're dying. They're, they're so sick when they come in. Injured. Some of them are even bleeding. It's horrifying. 
You know, who would let's get some healthy patients in here because that would be a lot easier to deal with. Our outcomes at the hospital would skyrocket, right? I mean, I actually, they kind of try and do this when they cook the books in all the hospital. Anyway, another lecture, I guess. <clears throat> but that, but the, again, you look at the student and you say, if we have a problem with the system, the flaw is with the student, never with the system. Students act out in class. Okay, hey, let's come up with a schedule in the day that has the students get a lot more exercise and physical activity outside so they don't feel so antsy and, and angst-ridden and they don't have all the young viv and vimmer vigor of youth to, to run through their systems. Then let's, like I said before, then let's give them some questions. Then let's give them some work to do. And so at every stage of the educational system, the, the K through 12 in particular, your, your ideal subject, uh, your platonically perfect student fails to appear. And so sort of as a corporate entity, uh, teachers and, and administration shrug and they go, Poof, what are you going to do? Right. Not, you know, we just got this faulty product and I guess, the, you know, we'll, we'll just have to deal with it as best we can and we'll give it some more tests. And when it fails those tests, we'll make it do some more homework or something else and we'll punish it and threaten it and do whatever else we have to do until it starts towing the line right this, this kind of thing uh, the, my favorite or favorite or certainly great example of this is so many so they, they said that to graduate in washington state you had to pass the math portion of the standardized state test which was a lie of course you didn't have to but they said that and they for a while they tried to enforce it but so many students failed they realized like wow we can't hold back you know we can't not graduate 60% of the student population. That would create all kinds of, you know, classroom space problem. I mean, it would just be a nightmare. And so they said, hey, you know what we're going to do? We're going to have a voluntary summer education program. So students can come in for free, no charge, and take math classes all summer. And then they can retake the test in the fall of their junior year. And they were shocked when no students basically signed up to take these classes. What, what is, and then, they, you know, they, they, why don't students, what is wrong with these students? They didn't pass that test. And now they don't want to come in the summer and take free, we're offering them free math classes the whole summer for them to take so they can pass that state mandated test. I mean, kids these days, sheesh, go figure. You know, so like, yeah, I mean, this, ah, it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. Uh, and again, by the way, this wouldn't be crazy if there was some evidence this was producing spectacularly good educational results. And I would say, hey, it's a crazy system, but look at the amazing improvement we've seen. Look at all of the incredible academic development that, you know, over and over and over again. But no. You also see the, the sense that the system has of, of their relationship to the world and to the students when they talk about things like STEM. Uh, and if you're not familiar, STEM is the current sort of acronym of the moment, which is science, technology, engineering, and math. And, it, you know, anyway, it's, it's just, it's, it's a stupid idea in every way. But they're constantly telling students, you have to think about or struggle to or get into you want to be in a stem field you want to do science technology engineering and math now what's strange about this is the people who are telling them this generally are not in science technology engineering or math so what they're saying to their students is whatever you do don't do what i did another reasonable thing for students to respond to this is to say well if it's such a great idea why aren't you doing it Right? Why are you here telling me to do something that you're actually not willing to do? And it's just this weird double messages that students get all of the time that, that say, we know what's best for you, we're not doing it, but you should definitely do it, even if you don't want to. I mean, I didn't do it, but I didn't want to do it, and I don't want to do it now, but I think you should do it, even if you don't want to. But, and it's like, oh, wait a second, so... That seems like a trick, right? This is, this is confusing. All those students are that confused about it. They just nod and go, sure, whatever. I'm going to study what I'm interested in and pursue the things that I find fascinating and exciting, which is, of course, the correct answer. But, you know, so there, this, this constant um, both blaming and sort of attempt to direct students in ways that have nothing to do with the students is a consistent 
sort of structural bias of the entire institution. And as I mentioned, the, one of the keys is to just listen to the language. So now these students who go through, and again, and again last example, and then I'll, I'll move on, I swear, is it, particularly when you get to high school, now they'll say, oh, you know, soft, these sophomores, they don't know how to write anything. I mean, the sophomores, they're just terrible. And again, so now you've been in school since you were five, and all of a sudden they're telling you you're terrible. Now, now they may not be able to write, which is fair enough, but if you're terrible and you've passed all your other classes, you see where there's a, this, this gets suspicious. And so sometimes students get frustrated like this. They're like, hey, I, I passed all my other classes. Why are you telling me I'm terrible now? Either you're being unbelievably vicious and, and unfair, or all of my preceding teachers and administrators have been lying to me. And it's probably a mix of both often. But so, you know, all of a sudden students will feel trapped by these, you know, they feel like little traps have been sprung on them. Hey, I got an A, I got an A, I got an A. You're telling me I'm getting an F? Wait a second. How can that be? That's not fair. So a lot of students leave. They drop out, by the way. Students drop out. They, you know, they don't say... Uh, um, our, our academic experience at our high school is so unpleasant that 20% of our student population decides they would just rather go elsewhere. No, 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 no. It's, again, it's the student who's a dropout. It's like a, a restaurant that keeps losing customers, saying our customers suck, right? We have the worst customers. They come in, they don't like it, they leave. They never come back. Those customers are the worst. Right, so the students, you know, it's like, well, perhaps you can make an institution that young people really want to participate in. You know, maybe that would be one approach. Now, no, because that would then put the, see, it would reverse, it would make an active voice sentence out of administration tries to design attractive higher edu or educational experience, you know, these, these sorts of things. But yeah, you, you don't hold your breath on that. It's the dropouts that are the problem. It's their fault. It's the society. It's the students. It's the culture. It's the outside dynamics. It's everything else, but mostly the students and particularly the young students. I do, I do love blaming the eight-year-olds. I think that's the core of all problems. So then we go through that. And again, about half the students, give or take, will go to college. And college is a very different mix of um, incentives and, and directives. And again, generally people are in college because they want to be, give or take, you know, want on a scale. But it's, or it seems like a natural next step or, you know, it's the parents just say, this is what you're going to do. Or they're like, oh, I know a subject I want to study. And so they show up and now the notion of the administration again comes in and it tells the students, okay, one, pick a major. You have to decide now. In many states, Washington State is one, you only get out-of-state tuition, very expensive. In-state tuition, plenty damn expensive. Out-of-state tuition, really eye-gougingly expensive. International tuition, like, wow. Um, if you take over a certain number of units, those units, then you have to pay out-of-state tuition. And our legislature and other legislatures have said, well, they, you know, they need to finish. The, the students need to get done. So get them their damn degrees and get them out the door. So the pressure on the students from the administration is be done, be finished, pick a major, stick with the major, graduate. You know, how much learning has to do with that? That's, we're gonna leave that up to the faculty members. For the students, however, it's a very different mix. It's like, well, how do I know what I want to do? Again, the burden is shifted on the student. You have to know, you have to choose. You're 19 years old, 20 years old. Why would we expect these people to already know what majors they want, what careers they want to pursue? By the way, the, the numbers are you know, VIX. It's a, it's a tough thing to define precisely, but it is clear that large numbers of people now, the majority of workers, switch careers some number of time. I mean, you have to define what a career is. And so it is a bit loose. A lot of social science research is very loose on this, but it's, but it's clear a lot of people will graduate with a computer science degree, work for, you know, 10 years in the computer science field, decide they want to change their life, get a real estate license, become a real estate broker, do that for a while and then go, yeah, you know, I've always wanted to, I'd like to go back and teach kids because I, I just literally love kids. And so then they'll get a teaching credential and go back and teach computers in elementary school, right? And this is a full, interesting and, and lovely life, but the emphasis 
in college now is like, no, this is not what we're planning. You have to get done. And to get done, you have to know what you're doing and you have to know what you're doing now because we'll actually punish you if you take too long. And, the, and again, the problem here is how are you supposed to know until you've, you know, looked around the world, checked things out, taken a bunch of different classes, tried some different majors, maybe dropped out, tried some other majors, you know, sort of felt around a little bit. This upsets the administration, actually it makes it difficult to administer because you don't know how many students you're going to have in what program at what time. So fair enough, it does create some complexity that is, is a little trickier to deal with. But basically, it is the extension of this uh, factory model. And they're like, look, students need to finish. For the student side, from the student perspective, what people tend to miss about this, and this is the whole sort of jobs uh, argument that you see, is like, oh, well, they should be getting an education for a job. Okay, what kind of job do you want? And it turns out that students really are pursuing, in general, lots of variation, of course, um, what might be called an opportunity policy. Students want to increase their opportunity to get the kinds of jobs they think might appeal to them, which is reasonable. Now, this is different from pursuing a job. It's like what I want to have is choice. I want to have the opportunity in a field vaguely related to things I'm interested in or a lifestyle I want to pursue uh, available to me upon graduation. And that's a very tricky dynamic. And, and I've talked to a lot of students from different colleges, our college, and I've done student advising. And this is generally the feel of what you get. You know, when I graduate, I want to have the opportunity to do things in this rough area with this sort of feel to it. I don't want to be in an office, or I do want to be in I want to work with a team. I want to work on my own. I'm interested in the sciences. If I never do math another day in my life, I will be super happy. And so, you know, this creates a spread of things. And so this drives planners and administrators crazy because they think, oh, well, what are a good job? Well, what jobs have high salary? Well, generally the highest salary for graduating, pe people graduating the bachelor's degree is petroleum engineering. So if students were pursuing a maximize income upon graduation strategy, petroleum engineering would be the most overwhelmingly enrolled major in the country. It is not the most overwhelmingly enrolled major in the country because basically no students, or not no students, few students, everything's on a bell curve, are pursuing that strategy. They're pursuing a life enrichment and opportunity strategy because they're smart. This is one reason they're in college, because they were able to think about this and go, oh, I don't necessarily want to put myself in a box over here. Some students do. They know exactly what they want to do, and they go for it. Good for them, right? That's not a problem. I'm not opposed to that. It's just many other students do not. Uh, I would say most students do not. They have a range or a concept or, or, or something like this where they go, oh, I think I want to do this. Or they think they want to do something. Uh, the, the classic example is people go, oh, I want to do math. And they find out, ooh, I'm good at math. And then you get to college and you find out that, ooh, this is a different level of good and a different amount of math. And so they go, oh, maybe I'll just turn the math down a little bit and go into electrical engineering. It's like, oh, yeah, this is the right amount of math. A little more application. I'm pretty happy. Or if the electrical engineering is a little too much, maybe I'll go down to mechanical engineering. And, you know, so, you know, you can, so people feel this out. They go, oh, I'm going to go into English, right? I'm gonna, and they take some English classes and do some literature and they write some papers. Like, ah, you know, that's maybe more writing of papers and reading of literature than I want. I mean, I'm really interested in history. So all of a sudden they switch over to history field or, or, you know, this kind of feeling your way through is not only should be expected, but it's just human. And it's a reasonable course to pursue when you're trying to develop an idea of where you want to focus your life for a foreseeable future. But again, the, the emphasis presses against this. You know, now, 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 some schools will sign contracts with you that say, oh, you know, sign this contract that you're going to enter this ma major the day you arrive and we guarantee you can graduate in four years. As if that's the goal. Uh, this, this notion of unceasing progress. The University of California, the California State University uh, system, which is huge. I forget how many students. It's, it's vast. Uh, you know, it's thousands and thousands and tens of thousands. I mean, again, I think it's over 100,000. It's just a lot of students. 
they decided that having students have a math requirement was impeding their progress towards graduation. So now you can graduate from the California State University system without taking any math. Now, you're not all majors, of course. You're not going to get an electrical engineering degree without some math. But this sort of requirement, right, was slowing a lot of students down. Like, oh, they're not able to make progress because they're having to take math three or four or five times. And so the question to ask is, is math basic math, some level of math, a necessary component to consider yourself educated and worthy of a degree. And you can say, hey, no, like, no, you don't need that degree. We, we're arguing that math is an, an unnecessary element and people don't need to understand even the most basic math for them to be consider themselves college educated and to move on in the world. Uh, or you could say, no, we do think that, you know, queen of the humanities, we should require math. But this was not how this was approached, and this was not the way they approached it with students. They didn't ask students what they thought. They just looked at the, the rate of success and the rate of progress, and they said, hey, this is slowing students down. We need to uh, just eliminate the requirement, not teach it differently, not provide different classes, not you know, come up with a, a, a better alternative way of presenting the same source of information. No. No, just eliminate it so then students don't have to worry about that. And so, yeah, it's just a strange set. Again, it's a weird set of incentives that students who are in an environment where being young, uh, generally speaking, and, and uh, inexperienced, we don't really have a reason to expect them to know what they want to do. They enter institutions that insist... I mean, ag often quite aggressively that they decide now what it is they want to do. And they enforce penalties, A, for switching majors. So if you go for a couple of years in a major and then decide to switch, you've used a lot of your units. And you're probably going to have to redo some of the basic requirements because if you do a big switch, then, you know, you might have to go back and do another year of preparatory courses then to pursue that major. So like the calculus series is a big switch. If, if you're going to, I told my students when I advised them, if you're interested in the environment, if you do the calculus series, then you can get into like environmental engineering or environmental sciences. If not, you could get environmental studies. This basically means you didn't do math. Right. <laughs> it's sort of the, you didn't do that much math. You do the calculus series, you can do the science or the engineering. If you don't do the calculus series, so it's a big switch. And if you go along in your education, very few students say, you know what, I'm going to just take a year, go back, do the calculus series, and then I can do the science part. Some do, which is, you know, credit to them. But the whole, the, but the press of the institution will tell them, no, I've seen this. I mean, I'm not, this is an absolute, and if you've been to college recently, I'm sure you've had experiences like this where they're just leaning on you, both, even the faculty sometimes, particularly administration, to say, you just need to decide. You just have to come up with an answer, and you have to come up with an answer now. And because of the expense of higher education, often this, you know, this ticking clock of, oh, I've got to pay more, I've got to pay more, says, okay, yeah, just you know, I've just got to do it. I've got to just jump in and, and make a decision and, and just go and we'll see. And then people graduate and they go, ah, oh, crap, <laughs> right? That was wrong. Whereas maybe if they'd spent another semester or another year or maybe another two years, they would have gone, oh, this is it. This is what I want. And then it would make much more sense. But again, at the higher education level, you get less of it, but you get a very, but the sim, often similar um, arguments like, oh, this, these students are unprepared. These students uh, don't know what they want to do. These students are taking too long. These students are not passing their classes. You let them into the school, by the way. So if you have students that aren't passing your classes that you let into your college, why are you blaming the students? You, you let them in saying, oh, yeah, these are the kinds of people we want. So you're wrong if, if that's it. Or there's a mismatch between your admissions policies and your classes. Um, generally, admission policy, let in as many students as possible because we want money, classes, many faculty members are like, hey, let's try and teach them something and have some standards, this kind of thing. But for this, again, you blame the students. Now, they're older now, so I think it's a little bit more fair to blame them, right? When you're 19, 20, 21, 22, sure, you're, you're, you begin to uh, incur blame. And I'm okay with that because you're, you're coming of age and you deserve responsibility for your decisions, your actions, your successes, and your failures, but not all of it. And the administration, I'm just saying, should maybe take a teeny bit of, of responsibility. If you let them in, 
and they fail all of your classes, hmm, something something is amiss. If if and, and by the way, they know this. I mean, this is not a mystery revelation. But again, it's the it's those damn students. Boy, it's those students. Can't do anything but blame the students over and over again. And so when you think about education and you think about students in the educational system, I think it's good to step back and say, what is it that students can be provided, particularly K through 12, that meets the ethical obligation that they are not necessarily there because they want to be, but that you can guarantee that they get that will make this pay off. And the only answer I've been able to come up with is something that gives them joy and health, which are not unrelated, of course. Because no matter what the outcome is, if they're having health-filled, joyful days, then the system is working because they're, they're not, you know, so you spend 12 years or, or 10 years in education and those days were joyful and healthful. Great wonderful uh then it worked right then how you graduated filled with joy and health i mean <laughs> ta-da right I mean, this sort of magic but that at least as i mean it's an imperfect world but but you know if that as a core philosophy and value would really aid uh rethinking how we approach some of these things but what we do now and this is no trick we know this is we say oh Kindergarten is for preparing for first grade. First grade is preparing for second grade. Second grade is preparing, you know, junior year is preparing for senior year and for getting ready for your uh, college applications. Senior year is for uh, graduating and going to college. College is preparing you for your career. And like, so at every step, you're not doing something. You're preparing to do something else. And what, and, and generally, because again, students fail tests, students unprepared, students need remedial education. They're not even preparing you for what's next. Rather than focusing on doing what you're doing on that day. Here we have a group of kids. They're in our care for a certain amount of time every day. What can we do to provide them with health and joy? To open their minds, uh, give them some exposure to the world. Maybe even share a few skills that will help them along the way. But, but you know, that's, that's about it. That's what you can do. Uh, and, and so it's just a completely rethinking what a student is. Uh, another way to ponder this is to say the factory model says students are clay. They are lumps of clay. You come in, you mold them, you stamp them, you bake them, and you send them out, and then they're a pot. Great. Uh, students are not clay. People are not clay. People are not mechanisms. People are, of course, I love gardening, so I like the analogy of people are plants. Uh, you get a bunch of plants in, the best thing you can do is give them the kinds of environments that they're going to thrive in. And some plants need a lot of sunlight and some good soil and a lot of water. Other plants like it in the shade a little bit. Uh, not so much water, perhaps, and, and a different kind of soil. And then and, you know, these plants need a lot of room between them, and those plants like to be packed close together. But different, they just need the kind of environment that will allow them to thrive and be whatever it is the sort of their native capacities are. They are you can't just stamp them and make a bowl or a tray or, a, you know, an ashtray or out of whatever piece of clay that you come along. But that's exactly how we behave. And then that's why we say, oh... They're a bad student. It's the student's fault because they're a bad piece of clay. You know, if you get some clay that's got some sand, too much sand in it or something, and it falls apart when you throw it. Well, you go, oh, yeah, I got, I got some bad clay. I didn't, that didn't work out very well. But no, that's that's not that's not what students are. That's not how we should think about them. I would argue. So, from the student experience, you're entering an institution that views you as transitory, as I mentioned before. You, you move through that, you're going away. The system is permanent, you are transitory. Therefore, your value is very low. You just don't matter to the institution because you're sort of, you're just ephemeral. Um, and second, that you are therefore the easiest target to blame because you have the least power to fight back. You have unbelievably limited capacity to resist the sort of system that you find yourself in. And 
that's not a good recipe, I would say. So blame the least powerful people who have the least opportunity to fight back and then just move them on in the system. And then years later, when they aren't doing well, say, oh gosh, look how terrible they're doing, even though we've been advancing in the system. By the way, none of this is revelatory. We all know this. This is something that we've just we just accept, we just look at the system and we go, well, this is the way it is. And, it's, and I like to think that perhaps it doesn't have to be this way. Maybe it does, but I like to imagine that perhaps it does not have to be this way, that we could rethink it enough to begin saying, hey, what if we just stop worrying about a lot of this extraneous material and worrying about next year and next year and next year, and just make sure that our, that our kids are five, eight, nine, 12 year olds are doing well today, feel good today, feel healthy today and enjoying themselves today and then see what happens over a couple of years. My guess is good things. Why would we expect not expect good things to happen? Uh, and by the way, in the United States, this experiment is basically being continually run because many states, my state in particular, have a, a, a decent to large proportion of the young people who are quote unquote homeschooled. And on average, this breaks down in two different camps. We have a homeschooling camp, which tends to be fairly rigorous, um, and they are Christian fundamentalists or various stripes. And, when, and because I received a lot of these in, in college, their first experience in an organized school would be coming into one of my classes, like one of my writing classes. And so generally speaking, their skills were fine, not excellent, but fine, but not better or worse on average than the other students who are coming from the, the traditional system. And homeschoolers often like to say, oh, look, my students, you know, my, my kid did as well or better than their peers in the public education system, to which I say, that's a pretty low standard, but okay, right? If that's it, great. That's your standard, nice. So you have that group of students, and then you have another group of students who I like to refer to as the sort of hippie parents who are like, look, I'm just going to let my kid run naked in the woods until they go to college. And they do. They you know, work on the farm or they work around the house. They raise organic vegetables. They build bikes. They raise goats. They have a big time, and they come in. Um, and the first time they've ever really been in an organized classroom of any kind is when they arrive. And you know what? They do fine too. <laughs> this is they do. They just do great, right? They're like there. I mean, they don't do necessarily better or worse. They just sort of, if you put them in the bell curve, they bell curve out just, just, just fine, right? You go, oh, okay. Some of them don't do that great. Some of them do great. Some of them do, and a lot of them, most of them do sort of in between the middle there. And so, we we kind of are doing these parallel studies, and the results suggest that it, you know, it the educational component, the learning component outcome is not that different. At least there's not a huge variation, at least what I've seen personally at my college and talking to other people anecdotally. That's like I said, I would love to see a large scale uh, longitudinal study done on something like this. But the vibrancy of the children or the students is very different. Their health, their outlook, their, their, the, their, 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 their cultural and physical development, all of these vastly different. And so that's why I think, you know, thinking about this and re-examining it uh, is very much worth doing from the student's perspective and from the health joy perspective in particular, rather than the, oh, you passed this test, you learned, you know, 17 different calculus equations. And finally, I'd like to leave off by saying, indeed, I believe we're going to run this experiment whether people want to or not. Because so many students were forced to be at home for so long over the last year uh, and a half or so, many, many parents I've spoken with, and I think the statistics are showing out around the country, are simply saying, yeah, we're not ever going to go back. Like, we, we, we might send them back to the schools part-time, we might do it a little bit, but they miss the socializing, they miss their friends, but there's a lot of things we don't miss, and we're starting to really rethink what we want our children to be experiencing. It's not Zoom classes, because everyone realized that that's sort of a suicide-inducing experience, but it is something else, right? We want to think about this differently. So in a way, uh, this experiment, which was already started with the growing homeschool movement, again, generally breaking in roughly into those two camps of the sort of 
uh, hippie parents and the sort of conservative Christian parents was growing and expanding and, and increasing in, in volume all over the United States. A lot of countries, I know this is totally illegal, but in the United States, it's, it's this gray area that's growing and becoming m more popular. And so schools may actually be forced to adapt simply by the uh, changing cultural environment in which they're having to operate. They're going to have to rethink their students and how they think about their students and the student experience in the educational institution. So students, thank you very much.